want to welcome you this morning. And it's, it's a pleasure for me to introduce an old friend, uh, Malithi Asante. Um, and I'll just read from the paper here. Uh, professor Asante is a uh, professor and chairperson of the Department of African American Studies at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Considered by his peers to be one of the most distinguished contemporary scholars, Professor Asante is the author of 32 books. The latest one is Thunder and Silence, the Mass Media in Africa. Dr. Asante has published more scholarly books than any contemporary African American. He received his PhD at the age of 26 and was appointed a full professor at Temple at the age of 30. He is the creator of the first doctoral program in African American studies in the world. And currently they have about 200 students pursuing the master and, and doctoral degrees at, at Temple, Temple University as a part of his department. Um, he's the founder of the Afrocentric Philosophical Movement and the National Afrocentric Institute. He's directed 42 doctoral students. Many of them serve in important posts throughout the world. And as we were discussing this morning, uh, Dr. Asante's program is probably producing the next generation of African American studies scholars. Uh, Dr. Asante was born in Valdosta, Georgia, edu educated at UCLA, and worked in Zimbabwe as a trainer of journalists. He's a poet, dramatist, painter, and gardener. His work on African culture and philosophy has been cited by the Journal of Black Studies, the Western Journal of Black Studies, Newsweek, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the National Council for Black Studies, the New York Times, the, D the Today Show, Night Watch, Night Talk, BET, the Tony Brown Show, McNeil Lira, NewsHour, and Nightline. He is regularly quoted on issues in the African world. He is the chairperson of the board of GRIO, an educational magazine and founding editor of the Journal of Black Studies. Asante is now completing a book called The Sources of African Tradition. Dr. Asante was last here in New Orleans, I think in August, uh, serving as a consultant for the New Orleans Board of Education. He's also a consultant for, for school systems in Baltimore, Detroit, Pleasantville, and Camden, New Jersey. Uh, and in all of these school districts, he is uh, assisting in the rewriting of curriculum. An activist scholar, Asante believes that it is not enough to know, one must also act to humanize the world. Dr. Malithi Asante. Thank you. First, let me say to Dr. Charles Fry and the Center for African and African American Studies here at Southern, I am delighted to have the opportunity to come and to speak to such a wonderful audience. Uh, I also would like to uh, give my thanks to the administration of this university and also to the many visitors who are here, and certainly the people from the New Orleans School District. I'm delighted uh, to see uh, all of you here, and those of you who are from New Iberville, uh, which is uh, also wonderful. Uh, those of you who have heard me before know that what I try to do is to give honor to my um, teachers. And my teachers in composition always said that you should always begin at the beginning, then go on through the middle, and then uh, conclude. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to start at the beginning this morning, and then I, I may make some digressions. I might uh, indeed uh, give some parables, some illustrations, uh, some proverbs, but hopefully I'll come back and then we will conclude properly. As people are coming in, uh, I thought that maybe what I should do is give you a number of anecdotes, but the first one is to help frame the discussion that I will have with you this morning. In 1854, 1854, you have to recall that the majority of African people in this country were uh, still uh, enslaved. In 1854, Admiral Perry went to Japan. It was the first time that the Americans had gone to Japan to, at least in a successful mission of opening up trade between the United States and Japan. So Admiral Perry went to Japan in 1854 
And in 1854, the Japanese decided that, okay, we'll trade uh, with the Americans. When they were invited on board the ship, that is, when the Japanese were invited on board the ship, the dignitaries of Japan, the Americans entertained them by giving them a minstrel show. And in this minstrel show, the white sailors dressed up like blacks and put on a performance for the Japanese. This was 1854. Africans were still being enslaved in this country, but already the, in the international scene, images of Africans were being presented in a negative, stereotypical light. I use that as a way of introducing what I'm going to talk about, and namely, that is Afrocentricity. Afrocentricity is a very simple idea. It's a part of a larger project. The larger project is an idea that I have called, in my own writings, centricity. And that is, in terms of centricity, the notion is that human beings must be given agency for human experiences. When you talk about centric ideas, you're talking about agency. You're talking about actors. You're talking about grounding people in historical place and circumstance. Afrocentricity is simply the idea that African people must be given agency. African students must be given agency. African people must feel a sense of accountability and responsibility because we are subjects of phenomena, of human phenomena, rather than simply objects. Now let me try to explain that, give you another illustration. There is a story of David Livingstone, who was lost in Africa, apparently, but really wasn't. But they sent Stanley after him. Stanley goes and he finds uh, Livingstone. The history of Central Africa for a long time was written mainly around the adventures of David Livingstone. And, of course, Stanley going to find him. Now, if you're an Afrocentrist, you must raise the question, how is it that two white men lost in an African forest could really capture the whole of what was happening in Central Africa? You cannot do that, unless, of course, you assume to impose the European experience as the only legitimate experience in human history. Africans have to be given subject place agency, acting place in human history. That's all Afrocentricity is. So when it comes to any subject, almost every subject that we can consider in our educational experience, if it's art appreciation and we're in high school and we are having art appreciation class and we are of African descent and we have no connectedness to the content of what is being presented, we are simply outside of the experience. We are on the margins of the experience because what we are getting is a white self-esteem curriculum. And the white self-esteem curriculum is promoted as if it is a universal curriculum, as if it is the human curriculum, as if there is nothing else that's happening anywhere in the world or anything else that matters. That creates a distortion in the human record. It was a deliberate distortion when it started. It has now become institutionalized throughout the Western world. Afrocentricity calls into question that conception of reality. It says you cannot propose the European particular experience as if it is the only human experience. You can't simply look at European literature and say that that is the sum total of the human experience, or politics in Europe, or history of Europe. These are particular experiences which are valid and important, but you cannot impose them when, you, when, when you're talking about Africans, and when you're talking to African people, and you're teaching African people, then African people certainly must be given subject place. You see, 
I was talking to a group of teachers last week in Philadelphia who taught, and these were mainly white teachers, and they taught a school, in a school district that was 90% black. So I said to them, um, how many of you take Ebony Magazine? A lot of them. I said, well, of course you read Jet, Ebony Man. Uh, never heard of Ebony Man, right? So I said, well, of course you visit black churches frequently. And maybe one did. But I said to him, how can you teach black students? I don't understand it. I, I, I have no, it's, to me, if you, if you don't know your audience, if you don't understand the historical place that African Americans exist in, how is it possible that you can ground these young people in the content of what it is you're teaching? Some of them say, well, I just know my subject. Well, you teach more than your subject. You teach students. See, some people say, I teach my, I teach my subject. You teach students. And if you teach students, you have to understand that there is no content, historical, political, social, cultural, artistic, no content in which African people cannot be viewed as subjects of that content. So, we have to understand that Afrocentricity is a simple idea. It has been uh, maligned. Uh, you get all kinds of people, Africans as well as whites, who attack the idea, the term, but have never read anything I've written. They just, uh, they just don't like it. They've never, I mean, you know, you get people who never, have never heard me talk, but who criticize me in the newspapers. So this guy is going around talking about Afrocentricity. But you know what the problem is? The problem is for the first time, or for one of the first times, we have an organized way of getting African people off of the psychological plantation. And it is, it has created great concern. Because what it means now is that there is no way, historically, for you to begin human history simply with the Greek experience. The Greeks are but children in the world. They are not, and then it amazes, it amazes me. People pick up books and they read the ancient world, and they start with the Greeks. And you're talking about 3,000 years of civilization, at least before the Greeks, that are simply ignored. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But it's very important that we understand what's happening when people talk about Afrocentricity. So it is a simple idea. It's a, and almost every person understands it when you talk, when you talk uh, to them about it. That all you are saying is that the African person must not be viewed as an object in the fringes of the European discussion or European experience, but must be given an acting role in human history must not be shunted to the side as marginal, must not be seen as on the periphery, but must be given the role of centrality. So if you're talking mathematics, then start mathematics where it should start, in Africa. You should start in Africa. That's the first place. In fact, even the Egyptian numbers did not come to Europe until 1311 when Leonardo Fibonacci brought those numbers into Europe. But they had been using in Europe at that time what I call slash marks. Slash mark one, two slashes, three slash Roman numerals. Before the Egyptian numbers came over. People call them Arabic numbers. But of course, the Arabs invaded Egypt in 641 AD and found the numbers. But, is it, but, we, we, but, we, but even that, even that we don't know because what has happened is the structure of information that we have been fed has kept us away from all African information. Very early on when African people were brought to the Americas, and remember that, African people were brought here. No slaves were ever brought from Africa. Africa
Africans. They were weavers, potters, artisans of all types, iron smelters, blacksmiths, diplomats, translators, poets, musicians, farmers, fishermen, fisherwomen, members of royal families. Africans were brought to America, no slaves. We were enslaved here. And until we understand that history, and until we see that connection, we will never understand that it is possible for us to view ourselves in the long line of the historical experiences of African people. And our children rarely see that. We have a slave consciousness. We have, in fact, a historical amnesia. And that historical amnesia is, whole, is, whole, is held in place by a structure of knowledge that forever says to the African person, you are nothing more than on the margins of the European experience. And the Afrocentrist says, you've got to reinvent the location of African people in our own place. When we got off the boat from the West Indies, on the, over here, Louisiana, wherever, got off the boat, and we said, my name is Obadike, or Amadou. They said, well, I'm going to call you Bill. <laughs> so already, Already the decentering process begins. The woman says, My name is Tobola Yefa. They say, That's too hard to say. I'm going to call you Mary. <laughs> so already the African, everything we had, all ideas. You say, I speak five languages. They say, You don't speak languages, you speak dialects. We say, Well, my religion is Yoruba or Akan. So you don't have a religion, you got cults. So everything was taken. I mean, how do you think you make a slave? Slaves are not born, you make a slave. And the process was called seasoning or breaking because you had to break people down. You had to season them before you could actually make them a slave. And that process of seasoning was that you took everything away that you could. You decentered the African. You dislocated the African. And already, of course, there was a physical dislocation because we were moved off of our own terms in terms of environment and geography. We were moved across the Middle Passage. And we called it the dreaded Middle Passage. The reason we called it the dreaded Middle Passage was because 35 to 80 days across the ocean was a horrible experience. No electricity on those ships, very little food, just enough water to quench the thirst of people crossing over, people dying all around you, men chained ankle to ankle, wrist to wrist, women brought over naked, people moaning, groaning, and when people died, we would say, gone she to her own friends, or gone he to his own country. So happy were the Africans that others had died and were leaving the horrible situation. We thought that was it. That was a, that's the dreaded Middle Passage. I am saying to you that very few African children understand that story, and very few white people understand that story. They don't get that story in school. In fact, they get now, and I've seen it in a number of textbooks, and we are rewriting these textbooks. We see it in a number of textbooks now. They get a very distorted picture of the oppression of Africans in this country. And you know what the distortions are? They're very interesting. That if it had not been for Africans enslaving their own people, there never would have been any slavery. No, you, you know, you really got to be way out to believe that. And a whole lot of folk believe that. The enslavement of Africans did not come with an impetus from Africa. It was a European initiative. And it was a European initiative supported not only by the commercial interests of Europe, but by the religious and political interests of Europe. 
the church supported it, they created something called the Asiento. And this was by the Spanish government and the Catholic Church. How do you think they stopped European nations from fighting over territory on the African continent? How do they stop the Dutch from fighting with the Spaniards or the Portuguese from fighting with the British when they were going to Africa to get Africans? The only way they could do it was because the church and the crown would come in and say, okay, we're giving the British the right to bring out Africans from this area, from this longitude to this longitude, from this latitude to this latitude, and they got 30, a 30 year lease on this. We're giving the French this much. We're giving the Dutch this much, and so forth. That is the way they did it. That's the way they prevented Europeans from killing each other over going to the continent of Africa. It was supported totally as a structure for economic development of the Americas and, of course, by the Europeans themselves. There was never in Africa any society of Africans where slavery was the principal mode of production. You will not find it anywhere in Africa where the economy, the society, was a slave society based principally on slavery. No. Now, were there Africans who participated with the Europeans? Were there collaborators? Yes. There were, there were Jews who collaborated with Nazis. There are Africans who collaborate with the South African apartheid government. But you can't blame Nazism on the Jews, and you cannot blame apartheid on the black police in South Africa. Neither can you blame slavery on Africans. But that's what they write in the textbooks. You know why they write it in the textbooks? It is to deal with white guilt. It is also to deal with white children. It is to protect them psychologically, while at the same time, it destroys African children psychologically. You see, it, it, is, it is how you do not deal with truth. So that consequently in this society, we have some strange ideas. We have strange ideas in the educational experience. We have people who do not want to confront their own racism. We have a society where Africans do not want to even confront their own Africanism. Now, I know down here this is not a problem because we're, we're in New Orleans. You've got a great history here. So I know it's not a problem here, but, but it's a problem everywhere else. Malcolm X was standing up talking like this once, and a sister raised her voice. She said, you know, you're just talking about Africa. I didn't leave nothing in Africa. He said, lady, you left your mind in Africa. <laughs> so, so I don't, but I don't know about here. I don't know about here. We, you may understand it, but we have a lot of confusion. And I give the illustration often of speaking at Harvard University and saying to a group of African-American law students, uh, could you identify for me five African ethnic groups who were brought to uh, the Americas? And um, it's amazing because more than a hundred different African ethnic groups were brought across the ocean. And we didn't come, we didn't get off the boat as African Americans. There were no such people. In fact, we were not really Americans till after 1865. So, so who were these African people? What were their ethnic groups? And we don't say tribes. We say ethnic groups. You know, when people talk about Yugoslavia and the people fight, they say ethnic factions. When they talk about South Africa, they say tribal factions. What, what, why do they do that? You think about it. It is all the dislocation of Africans and the use of pejoratives when it relates to African people and African culture. So I asked these students to name five African ethnic groups. And one little guy raised his hand. He said, Zulu. I knew he had been to New Orleans, right? <laughs> so, so, so I said, well, got it wrong. I said, the Zulu came from Southern Africa and from the Eastern side of South Africa, the Indian Ocean side. I don't think very many Zulu were brought here. So I said, you name me some Africans who were brought to, to this side, from the, from the West African side. And they, I mean, and I couldn't, I could not believe this, that these lost our best and our brightest couldn't identify five African ethnic groups that were brought to America. I said, who are we? 
I said, identify for me five European ethnic groups. They knew 15 or 20. They even knew Serbians, <laughs> Croatians, you know, French, German, Dutch, Irish, Scottish. So how does that happen in education? How does it happen in an educational system? It happens in an educational system because the educational system was not designed for Africans. It was not designed to serve African students. And that's not just the high, the high schools. The colleges were not designed for us either. <laughs> if they were, I'm telling you, if they were, there would be certain, there would be certain information that we would automatically know. From kindergarten, the child should have heard the name Yoruba and Igbo and, and Mandinka and Hausa and Fulani and Congo and Angola and Eve and Fante and Asante from, from a very early age. And yet our children do not know. And you ask me, people ask me, why do you think African-American teenagers are so crazy? To me, it's obvious. It's dislocation. It is the total movement off of terms. It is the making of people insane. And then getting them to believe that their insanity is real. You know, I'm scared of people like that. I was driving through the projects in Philadelphia, Richard Allen projects where Bill Cosby grew up. And there were about 13 guys chasing some other people. And I stopped my car. I was going to get out and tell the brothers, don't, don't, don't hurt these guys. So I stopped my car. And then I thought. <laughs> I said, I said, these guys may not be Afrocentric, you know. There, there's, no, there's, there's no basis of appeal. I mean, what can I say to them? I have no, they don't believe they're Africans. They don't have any understanding of their history. They have no value points or cultural reference points that I can appeal to. So I just got back in my car, <laughs> just like you would have done, right? So, and that's, and that's unfortunate. I mean, because you risk your life with people who have no cultural values, who value nothing, who have no understanding of the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice of, they, of their great-great-grandparents who do not understand at the least what it took for Africans to walk 20 and 30 miles to go to school to learn how to read and write. Many of them after slavery saying they wanted to learn how to read and, and read the Bible before they die. I mean, that was their will to take up nickels and dimes and build societies and schools and colleges so they could educate themselves and educate their posterity. That's what they did soon after the end of slavery. But if our children do not understand that, and if we don't understand uh, the historical connection in terms of what it meant for our ancestors, to pick cotton, as I pick cotton, till, you, till your fingers bleed, for $3 a day. Because I couldn't pick very much, you see. So, so I, you know, 100 pounds. They were paying $3 a 100 pounds, right? Our children don't know these stories like they ought to know them. And there's nowhere in the school system that they get them like they ought to get them. I'm saying to you, white children, however terrible they are in their scores compared to people outside this country, get from a very first grade, from the very first grade, from kindergarten, they get a dose of European culture. They know. In fact, not only do they know it, but they, and I'm saying that, and they give it and teach it 
even in situations where you have black students as if black students are not there. That's why I tell you that's the fringe notion. So we have, we, have, we have elementary schools where they dress black kids up like pilgrims. No, I, I, I've, I've dealt with all kinds. And you expect, and this is why I say, how do you expect an African child to really have any sense, any centering? In Georgia, when they integrated the schools, they still had the mascots from the Confederate Army. They still sang Dixie. Robert E. Lee was still a hero. And the Kappa Alpha Society was still very big in the college of the towns. And they came and did programs for the school. This was, and black children went to those schools. They didn't change the curriculum. The curriculum they had had before, the white school didn't change the curriculum. Same curriculum. Black children in the school taking the same curriculum that white children have been taking for years, which was, again, a white self-esteem curriculum. What do you think happened to the black children? They were Clarence-sized, just like Clarence Thomas. <laughs> it is, it's an easy process. And I'm sure sometimes we get Clarence-sized in black schools. It's the same process. It is when people do not understand their historical background. Look at it. Almost every subject field. If you take po politics, they start you with Plato, rather than Plato's teachers, Canufus and Seknufus, who were Africans. If you take art, they start you with Aeschylus. If you take um, drama, they start you with Sophocles or Aeschylus. If you take whatever you take, medicine, they will start you with uh, Hippocrates. Whatever, the, whatever, whatever field, they start you with a Greek at the, at the beginning. If you take communication and speech and rhetoric, they start you with Aristotle and the rhetoric of Plato, the Gorgias and the Phaedrus. So the idea is that there's a Greek behind everything, but that is supported by a very dangerous dogma. And that dogma is that the Greek people, and this was also in a textbook that I just saw in New Jersey, and we were working on this one. It says, the Greeks invented reason. <laughs> now, if you accept that dogma, there is no way for you to get out of a white supremacist structure if you accept that dogma that white people invented reason, then you mean nobody else in the world ever had this? And we had to wait to 800 BC to get the Greeks to do this. This is a dangerous dogma. And it was invented. It's an invented dogma. It is not a factual dogma. It's just, I mean, the, it's incorrect. But you know, you can take an incorrect dogma and you can build whole structures on it. And essentially, this is what, what we have. Let me explain to you very briefly that if you go back in human history, and you go back to 3200 BCE, before the Christian era, and you find the beginning of human, uh, uh, began the beginning of the first dynasty, rather, in the Nile Valley, 3200 BC. The human history, of course, is far older than that. But if you begin the first dynasty, the first united, organized society, the first organized society that wrote about its organization and about its structure, you find that on the African continent. That is an African civilization. We know that there were 16 kings before the first dynasty, at least 16 kings, probably more. When I went to Egypt last summer, we discovered that there may even have been as many as 60 kings before Menes. But we know Menes, 3200 BCE. 3200 BCE, there is no Greece. There is no Rome. There is no Britain. There is no Germany. There is no France. There is no, there's none, none of that. No writing, no written material. We don't know anything. 
2500 BCE, the Africans had completed the building of the pyramids. They're up, finished. The 80 great pyramids are finished 2500 years before Jesus Christ. We have not even lived 2500 years this side of Jesus Christ. So if you look back to Jesus Christ and you think from here and you think about how long that was, just think that, at, that when they finished building the pyramids, they were looking 25, you, if they looked 2,500 years later, it would be before Jesus Christ came. They already built the pyramids. Now, look, and the Greeks are not nowhere. You don't find them. You find the Chinese, the first dynasty of the Chinese, the Shia dynasty, and you find the um, Mesopotamians, but you don't find, but you don't find the, um, you don't find the Greeks, right? Now, look at this. You find the Indian civilizations of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, 2200 to 1800 BC, and you still don't find the Greeks. The first Greek voice is 800 BC. That's the voice of Homer. Homer was a student, according to um, uh, uh, Herodotus, Homer was a student of the Africans. But we still don't get the voice of the Greeks that they consider to be reason yet. And already by this time, we have in Africa the philosophers Kunanu, Patahotep, Kagimni, Winnie, Winamon, Keti, Pepe the first. We already have those philosophers before we get the first Greek philosopher. But the first Greek philosopher is Thales. He lived 600 before the Christian era. And you know what he says according to Plutarch in Plutarch's book? Plutarch says that Thales said to Pythagoras, who was a young man of 19, came to Thales, threw himself before him and said, Thales, you are an old man and a wise man. Teach me all that you know. And Thales said, young man, you must do as I have done and go and learn philosophy from the Africans. This is in Plutarch's lives. Look at this. The second great Greek philosopher was Isocrates. Isocrates writes in a book called Busiris. He says that he learned not only medicine, but philosophy from the Africans. Now, why doesn't this get into our curriculum? I'll explain to you why it doesn't. In the 1700s in Germany, there were two brothers, Willem von Humboldt and Friedrich von Humboldt. At the University of Göttingen, they developed a theory called the hierarchy of races. And when they developed this theory of the hierarchy of races, they had the Aryans, the, uh, the Alpines, and the Mediterraneans uh, in that order, and then they had the Africans and the Asians down below. Then what they did was to establish a system of uh, connecting the so-called Aryans to antiquity. And when they looked back in their own German history, they could find no ancient voices. So they leaped over the contemporary Mediterraneans, because they, they defined the Greeks as, as Mediterraneans, they leaped over them, and went right back to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle and said these were Aryans. They were not Mediterraneans. They were not like these present Greeks. These were different Greeks. And these Greeks were the direct ancestors to the Aryan race. And they connected a Greek notion to the Aryan notion. And then that was imposed on education in the West. Because you see, before this time, the Western education was largely based on what was called the Latin liberal tradition. This is where they had the quadrivium, the trivium. People did declamations coming out of the whole Latin tradition. But they imposed a Greek tradition. The Greek tradition had its impact not just in the curriculum, but all, in almost every cultural aspect of the West, including here deeply in the South, in the Deep South, of course, tremendous impact because people start building houses in America in the 19th century with the Greek pillars. They put these, these antebellum houses. Why do you think, where, where that influence came from? It was the German influence on America. And the German influence was to go back to get the Greeks because the Greeks they saw as democratic, and yet they were slave owners. So you can be, you can be 
Greek, you can have this Greek notion and yet at the same time own slaves. And so they built everything like that. They built their churches with pillars. Now we know they were Egyptian pillars, but they thought they were Greek, so we'll just go with that for now. But we, we, know, we but that's what they, they thought. So they built these antebellum houses, they built the banks, they built the churches, everything was neo-Greek. Everything was based in that. It was a great Greek period in the 19th century in this country. If you go back to the 17th century, you don't see it. You go, for example, to Colonia Williamsburg, built mainly in the 17th, in the 17th century, in, in, the, uh, in the 18th century. You don't see it, but in the 19th century, you see it. So in, in the 1700s, they were not building houses like that, but in the 1800s, they started building houses like that. It was because it was after the German influence, see, in the 1700s. Then people start building these antebellum houses, gazebos, the Greek shrines and their gardens calling Africans by Greek names like Socrates and Plato, you know, just playing with us. You know, just all kinds of stuff like that, right? That was a, this was the Ku Klux Klan period. Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux is a Greek word meaning circle. All of this, the fraternities, the sorority, the Greek letter organization. All of this, all these organizations, they came out of a neo-Greek period. So people were saying, yeah, let's do this. Let's go and get, and then, you know, and what we do, we go follow right along. I'm not going to get deep into that because I know where I am. But, <laughs> but, but I'm just telling you that that's the way it was. And, and, we, and part of it, of course, was, but part of it was the structure of knowledge that kept us away from our own information. See, if we had had our own information, we would have had, we would have had, uh, Kemetic letter organization, but we didn't know about Kemet. <laughs> See, we, we had no idea. We did not know. We thought the Greeks were the it. We didn't know they were but children to African classical civilization. <laughs> then we would have had all kind of, there would have been a whole different notion. There would have been a different understanding and that is why the Afrocentric idea is an idea that says there is nothing more correct for people of African descent that I own than our own historical experiences. That's right. At least somebody here is read. And it's important. This is the only thing. It's fundamental. All the other stuff doesn't matter. That is fundamental. You have to start from the ground upon which you stand. If you don't start upon the ground from which you stand, you will find yourself floating. And so it is fundamental for the African people to understand that. Now, what does that mean in a multicultural society? What it means is that there are a multiplicity of centers. It does not mean that you impose an Afrocentric worldview as if it is universal. It is simply the best when you are talking out of the historical experiences of African people. See, you cannot make Afrocentricity an ethnocentric view. See, ethnocentrism is what Eurocentrism has become. It is the promotion of the European particular experience as if it is universal. So when you promote it as if it's universal, then you say, for example, classical music, what comes to people's mind is European concert music. Because that's, that's, that's classical. So the Europeans have taken the word classical. You can't even say, you, no one thinks of classical Akan or classical Yoruba. Because classical has been captured. You say classical dance. You don't think of classical African dance, you think of ballet. Because the Europeans, see, they have promoted a Eurocentric view as universal. In fact, they have taken, as one of our scholars at Temple in the Afrocentric movement, Dr. Cato says, they have tried to take all the space. They have left no space for anyone. You can't, if you have, if you, if, if you even raise a question, they say, well, you're being separatist. You can't even raise a question because there is no space for you. So you don't want to promote Afrocentricity as an ethnocentric view. Afrocentricity 
says that there can be pluralism without hierarchy. In other words, there are many centers. I had a debate with Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. not long ago, and he could not understand this point because his idea was that America was essentially an Anglo-Germanic invention. And if you want to be an American, you got to be Anglo-Germanic. So he talked about why it was necessary for the Armenians to shorten their names, why it was necessary for the Polish people to change their names so they sound more English, and so forth. I told him it was racism. It was a promotion of an ethnocentric view, that that is not what constitutes America. In fact, America has always been a multicultural project. It has been a multicultural project with a monocultural, one culture, hegemony on the symbol systems, on the educational systems, on everything, so much so that it has confused a whole lot of people. An Armenian professor once said to me that he, uh, when he came to this country 17 years ago, uh, they asked him when he get, took his first job in the insurance business, what does your Armenian name translate to in English? And he said, there's no translation. They said, well, then, uh, what's your nickname? He said, I don't have a nickname. Then they said, well, of course, you, your colleagues want to know how they can be comfortable calling you. What, what, uh, what should they call you? And um, he uh, told me that he regrets to this day. He told him, call me Bob. <laughs> because what they did, you see, and that's the, that's the power of that, of, that, of that pressure for someone to be dislocated. The African people have been dislocated too long. And it has created an insanity. It has created an insanity so much so that a brother saw me with some kente cloth on. I use this illustration a lot because it's so powerful. Brother saw me with a kente cloth on, and he said to me, I used to wear kente too when I was in my ethnic phase. <laughs> and meanwhile, he had on a Scottish plaid scarf. So I said to him, well, that's ethnic, too. Well, what, what is more? I mean, you, you're still in your ethnic phase. <laughs> you know, it's, and it's an insane kind of thing. People wearing Italian shoes, Korean shirts. And because I'm wearing an African thing, they think that that's ethnic. What, all of it is. It's all culturally derived. There is nothing that is created that is not created out of culture. It just depends on whose culture you want to honor. And in America, America is a society of many cultures. It is one society. There are many cultures in this society. And what holds this society together are not the, is, not, is not the idea that everybody has to be the same. What holds the society together are principles that people have in terms of respecting each other's culture and not wanting to diss somebody's culture simply because it's not yours. That becomes a fun, see that becomes a fundamental issue. How can we as African people center ourselves so that in a society that is multicultural and multi-centric, we also affirm our own existence, and of course, respect the existence of others. That is the gift that I think Afrocentricity gives to the society and to the world. Now, I want to end by giving you just a bit more information historically about how this development emerged. Particularly, I want to just say something about the Egyptian piece because it's very important. The Nile River runs only on the continent of Africa no other continent. It is not in Asia. It is not in Europe. It is not in North America, South America. It is only in Africa. It is 4,100 miles long. That's longer than it is from California to New York. It runs wholly on the continent of Africa. The ancient civilization of Kemet uh, is a civilization that was connected to the civilization of Nubia, connected to Moroi, and to Aksum. Along the Nile Valley are hundreds of temples and shrines, 
thousands of tombs in which the black people of the Nile Valley demonstrated their own antiquity, who they were, and what their traditions were. It is along this valley that you see the beginning, for example, the beginnings of astronomy, the earliest calendars, the notions of the zodiac, the ideas of geometry and measurement, concepts of medicine, the earliest surgical tools, the earliest musical instruments. Along this valley, you see also the origin of the concept of the monarchy, the notion of the queenship, the earliest queen, uh, queens in, in the human history, and also the notions of religion, the fundamental basis of religions, uh, of many of the religions we know. When this became known that the majesty and the monumentality of the ancient Nile civilizations on the continent of Africa were more monumental than Greece and Rome combined. In other words, if you took all of the monuments of Greece and all the monuments of Rome and you combined them, you would not have Egypt. And, you would not, and certainly you would have Egypt and Nubia combined. In fact, there are more pyramids in the Sudan than there are in Egypt. They are younger, I mean, uh, more recent, but they are, they are more. So that you couldn't, so you wouldn't, so all of the construction, all of these, all of this development, you would not have. Now, how do you divorce that from the rest of Africa was a big issue in the 19th century. And that was the era when you had all of this discussion about the abolition of slavery in this country, the rise of all kinds of theories. I don't have time to go through them, but phrenology was one. The theory of phrenology was that it developed in Britain where the uh, Europeans decided they could tell by the shape of the skull uh, uh, about somebody's intelligence and somebody's character, and particularly about Africans. And they did a whole lot of stuff by talking about the shape of the skull. There was a, uh, a teleology theory the teleology theory was that there were certain people who were made for certain purposes and certain ends, and certainly Africans were made to be beasts of burdens and to be servants of whites. And many of their leading scholars wrote stuff like this. I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, and you know this and you've read this, but people like Hegel, for example, uh, Thomas Carlyle, who wrote, wrote in, 18, uh, in 1853, Thomas Carlyle wrote a, an occasional discourse on the nigger question in which he argued that uh, the African person was meant to be a servant and to be a slave and so on. So you have some of the wisest minds. I mean, what the, what the Europeans would call their, their greatest writers, the Cambridge Dictionary uh, of, of English Literature says that Carlyle was the moral force of his time. So, I mean, you, I mean that's the kind of uh, tag that they put on this guy who, who creates all these theories. Hegel, for example, the German. Uh, said, let us forget Africa, never to return to it, because Afri uh, Africa is outside of human history. So all of the, but these were the, the greatest intellectuals of Europe and of America. I mean, you have people in America, for example, the whole question of the use of anthropology, which I believe is the most racist of all the disciplines in terms of its origin. I mean, it was, it was developed primarily to show the distinction between other people and white people. And there was an anthropologist in Philadelphia in the 1800s, Morton, who collected 837 skulls. And what he did was to fill them with pepper seeds. His idea was to figure out uh, uh, the cranial capacities of different racial groups, which ones were larger, and so on. And therefore, if they were larger, they had to be more intelligent, and so forth. They were all, they, they were all, they, they had all, medicine was also involved in it. I mean, they had, the, 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 this was a big movement. All of this was to support the idea that there was no civilization in Africa. Boom, in the same century, at the top of the century, with the publication of the description of Egypt, which had been written by the people who went with Napoleon's army in 1799 in Egypt, they got this issue of what are we going to do, how are we going to explain, how are we going to justify the fact that Egypt is in Africa. That's the continent its own. No other continent. There it is. There's more written material about ancient Egypt than about ancient Greece. There's more, the Egyptians wrote more. In fact, they wrote on everything, all the walls, everything. 
If y'all want to go with me this summer, y'all can go, and I'll, I'll show you. I'll take you down into the tombs. You see, they wrote everywhere, and they painted themselves black. Except during the Greek period, when the Greeks ruled Egypt, <laughs> then the Greeks, when, they, when, they, when the Ptolemaic kings came in, and that dynasty came in, they painted themselves, at least the royal family painted themselves like they were. But I'm talking about thousands of years before the Greeks ever got there, before Alexander the Greek ever crossed the Mediterranean. You had in Africa itself, on this continent, in the tombs, on the, in the temples, the incredible history of African people. And it's the migration of African people from the east that peoples the rest of the continent. In fact, if you read the history of the Yoruba, Fadipe, for example, talks about the origin of the Yoruba in Egypt. If you read Sankanja's work on the Shona in Zimbabwe, the oral traditions are from Egypt. Sheikh Hamza Diop discovered that there were 12 languages in West Africa that had direct relationship to the Egyptian language. Teofilo Benga, the Congolese scholar, has discovered that in Central Africa, the relationship of all the customs, the traditions, the burial st styles are related directly to the ancient Nile Valley. Eva Maria Witz, in her book on the Asante kingship patterns and the Pharaonic kingship patterns, have shown the similarities between those patterns. The secret societies, as they were called, were not really secret societies. They were societies of secrets. They were the societies that Africans developed to maintain various traditions as they migrated and moved. Many of the movements were brought about by wars and jihads, by drought. But the greatest were brought about by the arrival of the Arabs from Arabia in the 7th century AD, 641 AD. Arabic is not indigenous to Egypt as a language. Neither, is, neither are the Arabs indigenous to Egypt. They came from Arabia into Egypt, overlaid the culture of the ancient Africans with the Arabic culture and with the Arabic language, stamped out for the most part the ancient Egyptian language, which you see on the hieroglyphics, the Madunetra. And that's the language of, ancient, of the ancient people of the Nile Valley. I am now finishing a book called Classical Africa, in which I'm discussing six major civilizations. And those six civilizations, three in the East, three in the West, are civilizations which I think capture the very heart of the peoples, of the, of the culture of the peoples of Africa. I'm just saying that I just gave you, I want to just give you that just as a jump off point because now almost in every subject you are in, you have to ask the question. If, the, if you read something and it starts with 800 BCE, you have to ask, well, what was going on in 2000 BCE? You know what I'm saying? You got to raise another question now. You can't just stop there. And, you, and that's what we've got to do. And then we've got to hook that up. In this country, at the end of the war, we went around looking for each other. We went looking for our brothers and our sisters, our husbands, our wives, our mothers, our fathers. And we said, hey, brother, hey, sister, stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet brought us to the place for which our parents sighed. We have come. Over a way that with tears have been watered, we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out of the gloomy past, till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Thank you.